Couldn't do one TV interview. Strange when he's tipped as a future PM, but perhaps it's because today's white paper follows a furious cabinet row that was still raging till yesterday evening. Immigration was at the heart of the 2016 referendum with the promise that Brexit would let Britain control its borders again. Brexit, it was said, would end freedom of movement here, the right of EU citizens to work anywhere in the European Union. And the PM visiting Heathrow this afternoon without Sajid Javid says cutting net migration to tens of thousands is still her goal. We have a, a great record as a country in welcoming people uh, who have made a huge contribution to our country, who've come here, who've migrated here, made a huge contribution and we will continue to do so in the future. But this does enable us to ensure that we are attracting the brightest and the best, that we're keeping migration, net migration down to sustainable levels, the tens of thousands, and that we have a system that is fair to working people. With the end of freedom of movement here at the end of 2020, Britain will treat EU migrants just the same as those from the rest of the world. For skilled migrants, there'll be no cap on numbers, and they can come here if sponsored by an employer. Skilled workers will be defined as having qualifications equal to A-level or better, and on a minimum income, which is suggested should be £30,000 a year, though some ministers think that's too high and the government will now consult on it. Unskilled migrants, in contrast, will, until 2025, be allowed to come here for just 12 months before having to return home for a year-long cooling-off period before they can apply again. This pub in St Albans in Hertfordshire is one of a chain of gastro pubs not far from Thank London. The owner says his business would suffer from both the 12 month limit on unskilled migrants and the 30,000 income threshold on skilled foreign labour. I think it, you know we, we couldn't afford to offer everybody a starting pay of that. We need people to come in to more junior roles and then as their, their skills go up then they are likely to progress you know way above 30,000 but you need people coming in at all different levels you then add to that um, sort of making the visas challenging and difficult to get well those people are going to head to Germany and Norway and elsewhere and not come to this country where we need them these European staff here under freedom of movement fear they'd never have been let in under the new regime I think it's going to be injustice because I covered my life to, to, since 2012. I'm here working, you know, all the time working. And, uh, no, I'm not be happy. I asked the immigration minister whether immigration could actually go up. We want to grow our economy. We want business to thrive and we want there to be good jobs. The Migration Advisory Committee has indicated that there shouldn't be a cap on high-skilled workers. But equally, we want to make sure that at the lower skill level that we're not bringing in cheap labour from overseas when we should be making sure that there is opportunities for young people in the UK. But a lot of employers need unskilled labour. Well, they do, and they should be seeking to reduce our youth unemployment still further. We've done a great job halving it since 2010, but actually there's still more work to go. The Prime Minister seems to have got her way for now, but it's clear other government departments will carry on fighting for a more open immigration policy. Things may not be settled until after Theresa May's own promised departure. Now, one of the sectors which relies heavily on lower skilled workers from abroad, especially the EU, is social care. And employers have warned they'll find it hard to adapt and fill vacancies when freedom of movement comes to an end. There's already a shortfall of around 90,000 care workers in the UK. And according to new research, hundreds of thousands of people could be left without carers over the next 10 years. Our senior home affairs correspondent, Simon Israel, has more. The story of Jinky and Godfred Drillon is an example of how skill and dedication is not enough in the current immigration system. For the past 12 years, this Filipino couple have dedicated themselves to looking after the elderly and vulnerable in England. But the Home Office have twice tried to end Jinky's visa because she wants missed a deadline. And now they wait for the outcome of their latest battle with the Home Office. And you're no longer allowed to work, is that right? Yes, that's correct, yeah. And how have you managed to cope with that? Or not? It's so hard, same one. <laughs> it's 
so hard. What have you been doing then? Well, nothing. Stay at home. That's it? Yeah. And how long has this been going on? Well, nearly a year. What upsets me is they, 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 they don't treat us like human beings. They, to us, uh, for them, us is just like a number. A number to be, just to meet their target for the immigration. This is part of the climate in which today the Home Office launched its vision for the future of the immigration system post-Brexit that will impact on the UK's care sector. New research suggests that more than 30% of England's adult residential care jobs risk being left unfilled in 10 years' time, and that translates to 850,000 people left without care. Carers from the EU have risen dramatically, 65% over the last five years, replacing migrant workers from elsewhere. And the end of freedom of movement would mean that EU workers would drop 44% by 2028. We have a social care sector which is chronically underfunded. It can't afford to pay the wages that will attract British workers. And now the government is announcing today that it plans to make it harder for the workers that are keeping the sector on its feet from coming to do those jobs in Britain. Mrs Drillon's senior post at the residential home in Morecambe remains unfilled. I was told it's been difficult finding someone with her attitude and tireless dedication. The couple have been caught up in the bureaucracy of immigration rule changes over the years and miscalculations. A judge will decide their future in the new year. But whatever minimum salary threshold the government finally sets, today's white paper doesn't promise to make the system any more obliging or welcoming for people like them. Simon Israel reporting. Now, since the white paper has been published, the Home Office hasn't been prepared to do any interviews. But in Westminster is our political correspondent, Michael Crick. Michael, what does the government think it's accomplished today? Well, to actually get the white paper published is uh, quite a, an achievement, given all the delays we've had, although it's been pretty chaotic today. I mean, they were rowing about it until uh, early yesterday evening. Uh, there are misprints in the document. Uh, there's confusion still in the Home Office over aspects of the policy. And there are still a lot of debates uh, to be had. As for uh, the critics, the business groups have come out today, the CBI, the House Builders, uh, the, uh, the British Chambers of Commerce and others condemning it. Uh, Labour, Diane Abbott said that uh, the white paper was a very alarming prospect for most employers. Uh, and uh, Diane Abbott said that high skilled uh, does not mean high pay. Most skilled workers earn less than £30,000. Although, of course, Labour's in difficulty on this because, of course, they too uh, want to get rid of freedom of movement. The Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, said it would have a very damaging effect on the Scottish economy. Michael Crick at Westminster. Cathy. Well, the European Union says it started making plans to deal with the disruption if there's a no-deal Brexit, describing it as a damage limitation exercise. Fourteen measures are being put in place, from flights over European territory to residency rights for British citizens, designed to protect EU nations from the fallout. Here, business leaders say they're watching in horror as politicians focus more on infighting than making proper plans for the future. Here's our business editor, Siobhan Kennedy. For this haulage firm in Dartford, it's all in the name. Its entire business is dedicated to moving goods between the UK and mainland Europe, hundreds of lorries crisscrossing every day. So from this trucker's point of view, a no deal is a big deal. I think the only thing we can do is start preparing for it. Uh, yes, it makes me quite angry, but we are where we are. They've already forked out £2 million on contingency planning, more space in the warehouse if goods are held up. And now the hunt for customs staff to help handle the inevitable avalanche of paperwork in the event of a no deal. But it's not just about them. Your business relies on all sorts of small yep. and medium manufacturers yep. whose goods you're transporting in those trucks, yep. all being totally across yep. the changes they need to make. Yep. Is that going to happen? I'd be very surprised if it happened. I imagine it definitely will not happen. I would have thought the wider economy will not be ready. And nor will the EU, it said today, as it spelt out its contingency plans. In a case of no deal scenario, of course, doing some preparation to minimise damage is better than not doing any preparation at all. 
But that preparation, it stressed, would be basic and time limited. 14 areas are covered in today's No Deal announcement. It's said to protect the vital interests of the EU. Lorry drivers will be allowed to drive on the continent for an additional nine months without a permit. A bare-bones aviation agreement will let British airlines fly in and out of Europe, but not within it. There were some concessions too on financial services. But in all, the EU emphasised the measures will not mitigate the overall impact of no deal and cannot replicate the benefits of EU membership. Any no-deal concessions from the EU are, of course, welcome, but just look behind me. All these thousands of products from up and down the UK rotate in and out of this warehouse in less than 10 hours. 120 of these lorries crisscross the channel every single day. So while any concessions for driver's permits are, of course, good news, this finely tuned operation could still be brought to a halt by delays at the ports and extra paperwork that a no deal would bring. Because that much was made clear by the EU today after it made no concessions for potential chaos at British ports and stressed that all goods passing through hubs like Dover would be subject to inspections and customs duties from day one if the UK leaves the EU with no deal. No deal would be a disaster for our country yeah. and no responsible government would ever allow it. Yeah. If the right honourable gentleman doesn't want to see money being spent on no deal, he's got an easy answer. Vote for this deal. But even she knows there's very little chance her deal as it stands will pass, no which is why the Cabinet yesterday signed off on another £2 billion of contingency spending and urged individuals and businesses to prepare for a disorderly exit. But today, the biggest business lobby groups were scathing, saying firms were watching in horror as the risk of a no-deal loomed ever larger. We do not want a no-deal Brexit. As they are here in Dartford, where Dan backed Remain while his firm's boss voted to leave the EU, but both agree on one thing, a no-deal would be a disaster for their business. Well, the European Union today failed to make a sweeping guarantee to British citizens living on the continent in the event of a no deal, despite a similar promise from Theresa May. Instead, the EU is encouraging individual nations to guarantee their status. I spoke to Catherine Dobson, a British woman living in France who's involved in the campaign to preserve expat rights after Brexit. I asked her what was her worst fear in the event of no deal. Our worst fears if there's no deal is simply that on the 29th of March, we're EU citizens, and on the 30th of March, we don't know what we are. So we could effectively end up being illegal residents in our own homes. So what toll is this taking on you? How anxious is it making you? We've been living in limbo for over 900 days now since the referendum. Um, we run businesses, we have families. We've been unable to plan going forward for all that time. We're now 100 days away from Brexit Day, and we're being told that we have no transition period. We've been told in 100 days we'll have a status, but we don't know what it is. We don't know how to apply for it. And we don't know what rights we're going to have under the new, the new, um, the new status. We, of course, were very, very stressed. I mean, how does that... Just, just give us an example of how that stress manifests itself. I mean, are you, are you staying awake at night worrying about this or do you trust at the end of the day it'll be all right? No, I think there's many of us who have sleepless nights. Um, for, you know, for instance, I've got three children who are aged 17, 19 and 21. My 17-year-old needs to apply for universities. We don't know what basis she can apply for universities. She's an EU citizen now. She won't be one on the 30th of March. My 21-year-old daughter is just starting out in work. How, how will they get the papers that they need at a time when they're very mobile and they have limited resources? Of course, we're all very worried. There are some very vulnerable people whose mental health has really been hurt over the last two years. And, and how will they take this latest news? What measures are you putting in place personally and as a family to try and, you know, make things OK on the 30th of March? Well, we've um, applied for our residency permits here in France. So my husband and I, we have got our permanent residency permits. So we have, we're to some, not secure, but we've done the best that we can do. It's far more difficult, as I said before, for our children, for our 21 and 19 year old to get their residency permits. So we are, 
it's, it's, it's just a challenging time for us all. Catherine Dobson speaking to me earlier. Well, joining me now from Dublin is Irish Senator Neil Richmond from the ruling Fine Gael party. Mr Richmond, how severely do you think Ireland would feel the impact of no deal? When it comes to the EU27, Ireland will feel the, the impact more severely than any of the others. Um, a no deal scenario is an absolute disaster for Ireland. It's something we've been working steadfastly over the last two and a half years to avoid. We believe we have a formula to avoid a no deal scenario and we very much hope that the British government can maintain their commitment to get some sort of deal to allow us to have an orderly Brexit. Right, so if it's so worrying to you, are you lobbying the other EU members to try and improve Theresa May's deal so you can take no deal off the table? We've done that intensely. We've got a deal. The negotiations went on for just, just under two years. This is the, the best deal that can be offered by the European Union that has a number of concessions from our side and yes. indeed has been met by concessions on the British side. Yes, but what if Theresa you're... May has asked for has been too vague. But if, you're so... Hang on a second, but if you're so worried about the disaster, as you put it, of no deal, isn't now the time to persuade the other EU leaders to come back with an improved version of Theresa May's deal because time's running out? We did that months ago. We've gone back and forth over the negotiation table for the past 18 months. This is the best deal with the most concessions given by both sides that will allow for an orderly Brexit. Brexit's going to be very, very bad one way or the other for Ireland and for the EU as a whole. Not as bad as it is for the UK, but what we have through this deal is the least worst option. Of course, the preferable idea would be if we weren't having Brexit at all, but that wasn't a choice of ours. We've got a deal here that allows for the maintenance of the single market, that protects the Good Friday Agreement, that allows us a 16-month transition period with the option of an additional two years to negotiate something that we can live with on an EU-UK basis through the future. Okay, but what the time is worse? For let me ask you. Okay, let me ask you a pointed question. What is worse? A further compromise on Theresa May's deal, for example, in the form of some kind of legal assurance on the backstop or something else. What's worse, that or no deal? The Every Brexit is bad. The withdrawal agreement has been agreed. The backstop is there in order to protect an international peace treaty lodged with the United Nations. Theresa May and her government have agreed this deal. They now need to get it through Parliament and we need to get it through the European Parliament, which we have committed to do so. But we you have haven't managed to maintain the togetherness. OK, but what's worse? Every Brexit further is bad. No, but a no deal scenario is catastrophic. No deal. So presumably a further risk. compromise is better than a catastrophic no deal? But what compromise are you talking about? What compromise is Theresa May looking for? Well, we she's spent looking two for a legal assurance, the or the Brexiteers are looking for a legal assurance on the backstop. The Brexiteers are also looking for things that are absolutely fantastical. They're looking for complete access to the European Union and trying to throw away all the tenants of the single market. They're trying to, throw, to tear up the Good Friday Agreement. What we have in the deal is the best deal possible, the least worst Brexit for both sides. Negotiations ended in November. They have been agreed upon. We have 100 days to avoid a no-deal Brexit. That can be avoided either by ratifying this deal or indeed by cancelling Brexit. Well, just to crystallise the impact of no deal, the former Cabinet Minister, Priti Patel, said that Ireland would face food shortages potentially if there was no deal. No, that's an absolutely grossly uh, ignorant comment from Ms Patel because Ireland produces enough food to feed about 35 million people. We have a population of less than 5 million. We are a net exporter of food, unlike the United Kingdom. Brexit absolutely will impact us and will be very terrible for us. It won't be as bad as it will be for the United Kingdom and we look at the amount of medicines that come in. This isn't a time where we should be threatening or issuing challenges. We've managed to agree a deal. We've managed to lessen the damages. We have to be realistic. There was a negotiation. It was a tortuous process. It went on for nearly two years and has produced this deal where both sides have comp compromised, both sides have sacrificed and we can either move on and avoid the no deal or indeed possibly stop Brexit if the UK chooses to do so. You talk about threats. Do you think that the threat or the spectre of no deal will eventually persuade Parliament to back Theresa May's deal? From our vantage point, it's getting the deal through the European Parliament when it votes to give assent on the 12th and 13th of March. Theresa May gave a commitment at the European Council that she'll bring this through the British system. She's already got it through her cabinet and now it has to go through Westminster. I have to underline, there are no more negotiation time time periods available. This is it. It's this deal. We need to get on with it because we're already making decisions. We saw the 14 measures announced by the European Commission. Mm. Individual member states will make more announcements in the run-up of, 
run up to Christmas of things that we do not want to do. We okay. are spending money that we need not to do. We can achieve the least worst Brexit by pursuing with the deal that has already been agreed.